Welcome back, everyone. What a fabulous way to start this uh, symposium on, on convergent science and to have uh, Francis Collins at Ned Sharpless, Tyler Jacks, and Matt Vanderheide to tee us off. So um, this is the beginning of the panel section of, uh, of the program, and it's a real delight for me to be chairing this session on convergent science. Um, the members of this panel really don't need any introduction, but I couldn't help myself <laughs> <laughs> from uh, taking more than a few minutes to uh, luxuriate in what each of these individuals has accomplished as an, a way of uh, figuring out how to introduce them to you, but I'm gonna be very brief. And what I'm hoping is that as we dive into the content of this panel, um, we'll be mostly engaging as a conversation group and not uh, just Q&A. So um, at the end of the group, there is Phil Sharp. Um, as you all know, Phil is a professor at MIT. He's been here for a long time, as uh, was described in the uh, history of the Koch Institute. Um, as you all know, he won a Nobel Prize for his studies on RNA splicing, and that was just the start of what has been a truly remarkable career. Um, he's been a founder of uh, many companies, including one of the earliest biotech startups, Biogen, which I think we could give credit for catalyzing the um, biotech mecca, which we're now experiencing in Kendall Square, in which we see metastasizing all over greater Boston and beyond. Um, next to him is Sangeeta Bhatia, who's also a member of the Koch Institute for Can Integrative Cancer Research here. Um, she's a biomedical engineer, she's a nanotechnologist, an entrepreneur, and she started, I, I lose count of the number of companies that she started. <laughs> she tells a story of her father asking her when she was gonna start a company, and then as soon as that was started, the question was, and when's your next? And so I think they come along with some somewhat regular <laughs> intervals, but they are um, obviously, um, focused on taking the products of the discoveries in her lab and making them available to patients, as we just heard, it's critically important from both Francis and, um, and Ned. Um, then we have Aviv Regev. We're so happy to have you back. I still consider Aviv to be a member of the MIT faculty and part of the Kendall Square uh, Brain Trust, uh, but she is now serving as executive vice president and head of Genentech uh, research and early development at this now combined company, Genentech Roche and Aviv, we have missed you, but we will pick your brain while you're here. <laughs> and finally, Paula Hammond, just to my left, is the department head of chemical engineering here at MIT. She's also one of the founding members of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. And um, like the others, she lives a dual or a triple life uh, as an academic engineer and an entrepreneur. She specializes in controlled nanoparticle compositions for things like time drug delivery and disease detection. It seems like every time I turn around, she's figured out how to use this, her remarkable insight into the chemistry of compounds and, the, and how to engineer these to productive use in you know, completely new ways to think of, uh, you know, a, a new way to apply her extraordinary engineering insights to uh, real health differences. So, what I'm hoping to do with this conversation is to address the frontiers of converging disciplines. This is the premise of the Koch Institute, that if we brought together biologists, cancer biologists, with engineers, clinicians, um, physical scientists, we could find new ways to approach the detection and treatment of cancer. And as you heard from both Tyler and Matt, is we have had, um, at least to my mind, far greater success than I could have anticipated at the outset. It's been an extraordinarily collaborative enterprise that I think has taught us all how to work together in ways that, frankly, we wouldn't have imagined uh, uh, 10 years ago. Um, and, um, you know, kind of one of the things that we're challenged by, and we heard, again, this both from Francis Collins and Ned Sharpless, how do we uh, push one another and ourselves to get beyond the comfort zone of the disciplines in which we were raised into that unknown and unmapped space between disciplines? And, that's kind of where I want to focus our conversation today to think together about what are the unexplored spaces that might hold the real keys to greater advances uh, in cancer. So let's begin um, by all of you helping me give the audience a concrete sense of what we mean when we say convergent science. So um, I thought it would be fun to uh, actually test that hypothesis by asking you to describe um, what is the best example, or frankly, the most surprising 
example of disciplinary boundary crossing. So Paul, why don't you start, and we'll let the conversation roll from there. All right. Uh, when I thought about this question, I thought about the fact that I'm someone who comes from a very chemical background. I'm used to working with molecules and uh, trying to understand how to manipulate them. Uh, when I became a part of the Koch Institute, this was a real opportunity to spend time and rub elbows with biologists and with clinicians. And in doing so, I came to understand a huge amount, as did members of my lab. And in those interactions, we began to understand that along with this uh, molecular level manipulation, there are very different kinds of responses that cells have uh, to the chemistries that we put on these nanoparticles, something that we would never have come to understand if we weren't able to work with incredibly uh, uh, clever biologists and uh, people who understood the immune system. And what I think is uh, very exciting is the fact that we can combine these understandings. So uh, one good example is early on, uh, we learned from biologists that ovarian cancer emerges from these very early stick lesions. Uh, and uh, for someone who works in nanomedicine, uh, we're typically focused on just the tumor, but by understanding what these stick lesions present, there may be opportunities to detect ovarian cancer very early on. Uh, so in uh, a collaboration that is really based on uh, the work that Angela Belcher has uh, developed in developing nanoparticles that can detect, and uh, that uh, is based on the biology that comes from uh, essentially uh, cancer cell biologists like Ronnie Drapkin, uh, and has led to very interesting developments in understanding um, what we are looking for. Uh, there's now in the Breakthrough Cancer uh, Project an opportunity to look at patient samples and from those patient samples actually understand what those unique biomarkers might be. So then we can develop a nanoparticle that targets those specific biomarkers uh, early on in a cancer that is typically detected very late. So this is just one example. I think another one that was surprising to me and exciting, you'll hear more about uh, when we have our young scientist group, uh, Joelle will be speaking about, but it involves essentially using uh, the kinds of techniques developed in the Broad Institute, uh, which uh, involve everything from DNA barcoding and genetic sequencing uh, to uh, very uh, large-scale approaches to assaying uh, cells and their interactions. Uh, and in this work, uh, we combined our nanoparticle science with a development that was really evolved around drug discovery and we're able to determine how nanoparticles interact with cancer cells. So uh, I think you'll hear a little bit more about that, but in, in that sense, it's surprising to anticipate that by interacting with everything from uh, the sort of uh, artificial intelligence machine learning environment to uh, the biological to molecular environment, we can get new developments. Great. Aviv? Maybe I'll almost pick up from where Paula left. I, I didn't expect that, by the way. <laughs> but when you went down the, and now we're looking at how the nanoparticle is interacting with the cancer cell and using these genomic methods. I was like, maybe even the same genomic methods. I'm not sure. I'll have to wait for the talk. But um, the example I thought of highlighting was single cell genomics, mm -hmm. and not as people know it now, but as it was in 2012 or so, so about I was 10 hoping years you'd ago. Do, I was really hoping you'd do that. Thank so. you. I had a guess. Um, but I think it actually illustrates something important that many people are not aware of as much because it happened a long time, a pretty long time ago, but also when, when the field was extremely small and consisted of very few people and you knew every paper that anyone wrote about anything, and then you can't do that anymore after a while. But the, the point I wanted to make is that in the very early days of single cell genomics, there was this really nice uh, technical success in profiling the RNA of individual cells, and the number was really a handful. Right, people would profile a cell. We profiled in our first paper 18 cells, and we thought that was a very big number. And the field was at a juncture, somewhere between 2012 to 2013 probably, where the immediate instinct, especially of people who did genomics, was to try to get to be as comprehensive as possible at the level of an individual cell. So you got kind of crappy data, to be honest. You only could see some of the transcript in that individual cell. And there was this immediate instinct 
to go and just improve, say, the molecular biology so you would capture a lot more of the RNA of that cell and learn more about the RNA, about the cell, too. And I think what was important in our work at that time is that we looked at it with the eyes of a computational person rather than with the eyes of the biologist, while well, being both of them at the same time, the same person, two halves of the brain, right? And from a statistician or a mathematician or a computer scientist perspective, you look at the data and you ask yourself, why can I learn anything from this? This data is like total, like bad data. Let me use polite <laughs> words. Bad data. Very small, random sampling of the RNA in the cell. Maybe you're sampling 5% of the RNA in this cell. So why would you actually want to say anything about that individual cell? And it's true. For if you're measuring one or a few cells, there's only so much that you would be able to do. So you would think, oh, I should get the rest of the RNA. And the answer is not that. The answer is you're already seeing patterns because statistically, the genes are co-expressing with each other. And there's structure in how the mm -hmm. genes are co-expressed within the cell and between the cells. That structure can be picked up by algorithms. And while one approach could have been to just improve what you could do with an individual cell, a computational person would say, just give me more cells. And quantity becomes quality. And by the way, that is a very natural lesson for people who do machine learning. Because you know, when we get these beautiful language models that now allow us to do magnificent things, they actually also use pretty crappy data. I mean, it's just stuff from the web. It's not really translated by anyone in particular. It's not really annotated by anyone. But its volume becomes its quality. That's what algorithms can do for you. And realizing that, from a computational point of view, while understanding why it happens from a biological point of view, you say, OK, then I want a different kind of lab method. And that led us down the path of doing what is known today as massively parallel single-cell RNA-seq, where, in fact, we got even less of RNA per cell than the original methods we were using, but we got orders of magnitude more cells. That was a better design. It was a design that was made for what we call inference, design for inference. You're doing the experiment in a way that would allow an algorithm to pick something out of it. And of course, you're doing the algorithm in a way that would allow you to pick some good biology out of it. I think we underestimated how much algorithms would allow us to recover from these kinds of data. We definitely didn't overestimate how well they would do. So for me, that's a good example. Because it's not just that you bring one thing and you bring another thing and you kind of ask one to help the other. I mean, it's not, here's my data, analyze it for me. It's, here's the problem that we have look at it with different eyes, and suggest, oh, we can actually address it in a radically different way, and different than our you know, pre-existing conceptions of each of our own fields. And once we do this, all of a sudden, this beautiful biology really spans in front of our eyes that, that, to be frank, I think most people, if not all people, didn't expect the magnitude of how much you would be able to see if you did it in this different way. And there's many, many examples, I think, of that. But that one, that one kind of worked out, too. There's also many cases where it doesn't work out. But it's worth trying. No, I, I so love that's this. Because you know, your example is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. <laughs> right? yeah. But it's really a statistical point yeah. of view, right? That you don't actually want to know anything about that one individual cell. That mm -hmm. cell is gone anyway. You blew it up. What you want to know is something about the distribution. You want to know something about the statistics of the phenomenon. And so you go into the measurements in a completely different mindset. That leads you to develop different lab experiments that are only successful because algorithms exist to analyze them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's nothing. It's all just this you know, noisy, yeah. messy, bad data. Great example. Yeah. Sangeeta, surprise yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might, I might surprise you. So I'm going to a non-cancer example, actually, of convergence, which I think a point about convergence that I, I think the audience should leave with is that it builds on sort of long-standing investments in fields that are coming together that really weren't intended for that purpose. And so it won't surprise you that I'll use the example of nanotechnology. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it's actually really worth thinking about that these, these tools were really developed for speeding computation. Mm -hmm. So microchip fa fabrication methods are designed, these are team scientists making integrated circuits smaller and smaller and smaller so that the, the features in your current smartphone are now five nanometers. And what's been fascinating about that is that as biomedical scientists, we can now borrow those tools, uh, not for what they were intended, although computation is important and faster, but actually for, for, for novel devices. And the example I want to give you, which is a non-cancer example, is, is the pandemic. 
So there are three aspects of the pandemic that you all have experienced that are nanotechnology enabled that you may not have recognized. The first is variant detection. So those are nanopore sequences. The second is rapid antigen tests. Those are nanoparticles that turn that line, the color that you see. Uh, and the third are lipid nanoparticles that deliver mRNA vaccines. So what's so exciting about that is that it, the longstanding investments in nanotechnology enabled us to respond to the pandemic you know, as a community. And now I think we can think about what does it mean for cancer? So just to, picking up on the lipid nanomaterials, they're now, they've now been in millions of people delivering mRNA. And you, you heard about the promise of cancer vaccines earlier. There's a lot of discussion amongst our community about what are the right materials? How do they enable, M, enable mRNA delivery? And, and now we know so much more and really well poised now to take those learnings um, you know, and come back to cancer. So that's my example. Great. Phil. Sangeeta stole one of them. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to go last. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, there's so many. It's so pervasive in my life now and the life of the, the Coke that it's hard to think about, mm. you know, it not being just what happens. I mean, the nanoparticle, lipid nanoparticles, was really highly influenced by Dan Anderson and Bob Langer. Mm -hmm. uh, as engineers in the Coke and in delivery of small RNAs and now delivery of messenger RNAs, and that whole field has just opened up a, who, a, no, a new therapeutic modality. Uh, you know, we'll talk about it later, I think, but the idea that machine learning analysis of radiological images of breast could go from a laboratory to being used to, to recall patient, patients for imaging. In three years, the impact patient's lives in that period of time is just unbelievable. And it's a product of you know, having a converging community. And right now, you know, my colleague here, uh, Rick Young and myself, are collaborating with Kim Engineering physicist Arup Chattabarty to look at condensates. And this is really basic stuff. It's how cells work. And we are, you know, and the whole field is being reshaped by this type of collaboration between physicists and cell biologists and cancer biologists, and it's going to go all the way from how to develop drugs to how to interpret signaling pathways to, to how to understand disease and prevention. And uh, it's just part of life. When I walk into the Coke, it's just, you know, it, it, every day is a new conversation, and every day is something that brings these remarkable advances across various fields together for cancer. And it's, it's really been an unbelievable productive uh, movement. Yeah, so several of you have kind of touched on the, um, yeah, for those who are of a certain generation, <laughs> the kind of astonishing applications of computer science, so machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I'm sure there will be other names that we become familiar with. But why don't we spend a few minutes actually talking about that? Because I think for um, perhaps the students who are coming along studying biology or cancer biology today, it's not so distant, but um, it's a new generation. And, and the generations who are already in the field did not grow up thinking that computation was going to do anything except allow them to process their numbers a little bit more you know, rapidly. So let's talk about where we are. And, and at, at the end, I want to come back and, and talk about the implications on the structure of institutions and how we should be thinking about education uh, in higher ed in grad school. But, but let's talk some more about these computational insights. And Aviva, I just, I, let's start with you, because um, you described so beautifully how um, you know, using the tools that are available, you discover in the space between those tools and tools from another field a world you didn't even know existed. Right? <laughs> and so talk a little bit more about the opportunities that you see, I would say particularly for um, 
cancer research, but even more broadly, because um, as I just said, it is very hard uh, to anticipate where the future is going to hold or what any of these convergent um, uh, activities will actually yield. We enter into them with hopes, but our hopes are often not that they're not met, but just they're more than the hopes we had. It's, it's really difficult to keep the answer short. <laughs> I'll do my best. First, I'll say that algorithms, in particular machine learning algorithms, come in three flavors. Sometimes you get all three, but each one of them, I think, addresses mm. some of the things that are really difficult for us in biology, in cancer research, in drug development, in any of these endeavors. They can help. They can be predictive. And we are really bad at making predictions. I mean, Phil was talking earlier about radiology. In any of these cases, our ability to actually predict what would happen without coming, doing the experiment, and seeing what happened is pretty abysmal still today. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see the glimpses of that. People get excited about something like AlphaFold because it's actually predictive. But we have very few things that are predictive. We can describe the results we got. It's not the same as we can predict what would happen in an experiment we've never done. Or for an individual before that, something happened to them. So they can be predictive, and sometimes remarkably so. They can be generative, meaning they can imagine new things that didn't happen before, and anyone that played with a language model has seen some of the beauty of that or has played with you know, the image-based stuff. But that is also true in our world. For example, in drug discovery and development, you generate new things in the world. It's not just about how things work. It's about making the next thing right, for a biogen or nanoparticles or whatever it is. So they can be generative. They can look at the past and imagine something new for you that you didn't see before. And the third thing is that they can be interpretable. And of course, if you have all three, it's the trifecta. Because interpretability as scientists is really important for us. We want to understand why, how, not just it has somehow worked. And that's the part that's sometimes dissatisfying for us about the other part. And all three areas of these have now borne amazing fruit in other fields, but also in biology and its adjacent areas that are relevant to things like cancer research and cancer therapeutics. So it's a really broad opportunity. So I'll try to pick just one thread, because it's impossible. I said mm -hmm. I could speak on and on and on. I would still feel that we haven't scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. And I'll use a particular word for that, oracle. One of the things that models can be amazing for is to behave like oracles, that you ask them a question, and they give you some answer. And so they can become part of a loop with the lab. Meaning you do experiments in the lab, you generate some data, you use that data to train a model, and if you had the right kind of data and the right kind mm -hmm. of model and the right kind of everything and the stars align, that model can become an oracle. And now you can deploy it for different things. For example, I love regulatory systems in cells, so I want to know what happens if you perturb five genes at once, mm -hmm. right? Which kind of data and which kinds of experiments to do to do that efficiently, that's a question in its own right that algorithms can help with. But if you get to the point where you actually can have something that make these predictions, it doesn't need to be perfect, but it's enough if it's kind of in the right trend. Then it can feed your loop. Or, you know, somebody else might want to design small molecules or large molecules or the right composition of the nanoparticle or anything like that. Just like with perturbing five genes at once, the space of possibilities far exceeds the number of experiments anyone would ever be able to do, and in many cases, the number of atoms in the universe. So it's just not going to happen by trying everything on its own. But oracles somehow learn from data to make a representation of the world that can say things and generate things that haven't existed in an efficient way. They also can't just, even in silico, even in a computer, you can't run through all the possibilities, not if it's more than the number of atoms in the world. That's not computable for us. But you can still make these predictions. So now you can feed that, say, to a small molecule discovery effort. And you train it on data, which can be abundant data, but it can look at places that were in chemical space that you weren't before. Mm. Or you can change 50% of the residues on your antibody, which you can't imagine as an antibody engineer, or try, I don't know how many combinations in the nanoparticles of the different pieces that come in, and it would make predictions for you. And it doesn't replace the scientist, and it doesn't replace the experiment, but it puts it orders of magnitude away from where it was before. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the areas where for predictable and generative algorithms is really exciting for us. And I'll just think in one comment on the interpretability. One of the difficult things, and it's really abundant when you think about cancer, is that you have many different orders, layers of organization in the body. You have genetics, 
You have cells and all their profiles and their condensates and their molecules and all their properties. And then you have tissues. And then you have the organ and you see it in radiology. And we don't know how to connect these at all. We look at most of them separate from each other, even though we know they're just one thing and there isn't any ether. There is a mapping between them. Mm -hmm. And algorithms are good at doing this kind of mapping. And hopefully, one day would tell us or would help us see where are the connections between these layers. So that's, I think, the, the more scientific view of this rather than just a pragmatical one. Phil. I want to ask a question about uh, Aviv's comments, because the major criticism of the application of machine learning to data is interpretability. Right. You, you, the, the process will tell you something, and you can do further experiments based on that and confirm it. But predictability, uh, interpretability, is something that people do raise. Uh, and it, it, it is a challenge in the whole field, uh, how to deal with it, devising mechanism. So how do you say interpretability this is, is in this, in this yeah. process? Because I think it's, it is a, it's the most interesting aspect of machine learning in biology. And this is where convergence is so interesting. So in fact, now you basically made yourself a new experimental system, just one oh, that yes. takes less time. Yeah. Yeah. And who is really good at taking a system that's kind of messy and opaque and unknown and knows how to poke it really well to see how it's really working and interpret it? Biologists. Yes. <laughs> and so here's the amazing thing. When you think about inter an interpretability framework, first you learn your algorithm. And now you come to it really with a mindset of an experimentalist, and you're experimenting on the algorithm. On yeah. Actually, on the model learned Learn by the, the algorithm, algorithm, to be fair, not yeah. on the algorithm itself. You're, you're experimenting on the model that was already learned. And you use the same things we're so good at as experimentalists. You poke and you prod it, and you see what happens. What happens from the input-output, and what happens on the inside of the model. And from this, you learn the interpretability. So for example, an oracle for small molecules, one of the things that it does is say, here's another small molecule that would have the properties yeah. you desire, but it can also color for you pieces of the molecule and say, this is why. And that's medicinal chemistry language, yeah. which I actually don't speak at all. It's like Chinese <laughs> to me. I really don't know it. Um, but it's, it's the same is true for, uh, bio, you know, uh, like the work that Anshun Kundaji in Stanford does on the regulatory system. First yeah. learns the model and then pokes and prods it really like we do in the lab and says, OK, these are the sites that matter. These are the bases in them that are important. All of the things that we know how to do, but in a different way. It, That's convergence. It, it's very complicated. Very complicated, I'm, I'm, but not I'm in I'm working on this with splicing yeah. with machine learners at MIT. And all I can tell you, going from that algorithm to, to, to the input parameters, it's very, very interesting. Hard. It's exciting, but it's very difficult. It's hard, and it needs to be data-driven. And that's why you need to have a loop. You yeah. can't just have, here's a data set, and I'll figure everything. Yeah. No, you have to iterate many, many, many times over. And the experiments need to be done differently in a way that allows you yeah. to do that. Paula, uh, jump in. I mm -hmm. actually wanted to say something, because what uh, Aviv actually described so well explains why, in education, we still need biologists who can engage <laughs> with people who understand machine learning yes. and artificial intelligence. We still need engineers who understand the primary design components of a nanoparticle, for example. How can we design a nanoparticle that uh, engages the immune system, engages specific immune cells? So uh, when we talk about how to structure education, uh, the idea is that we have these incredibly powerful computational tools. Uh, and they can take, for example, a, a, an immense world of molecules, a chemistry, if we're thinking about a chemical example, and apply it to a specific problem. But who shapes the problem? And who tweaks it? And who decides uh, these are the areas where we're going to focus? Yes. You need that training. I am so with you. The yeah. problem definition <clears throat> is one of the most difficult and important things to do. And it's so critical to know what's a good problem to solve, what's a meaningful formulation. That is the heart of doing great science. Yeah. And it's not, and also I have to say, the algorithms are fine. They're awesome. 
they are far, far from where we need to be. And in some of the things that matter to us the most as biologists, for example, understanding the impact of interventions, they're way behind because there wasn't actually data like the kind that biologists or chemists or so on generate. And there weren't the, kind, the same kinds of problems. And we don't, can't shoehorn our problems into that mold. It's more to look at that, it's more to say, OK, there's an opportunity there. But now you have to ask your own question and define your own solution. So amen to everything you said. Yeah. Go ahead, Snakeide. Yeah. I, I just wanted to build on um, Paula's comment, too, which is to say, um, I think one of the things about how do you do convergent science intentionally is, of course, to have different disciplines, people with deep expertise coming together to define and work the problem. Maybe something, I don't know if my panelists, my panelists agree about this, but I think you also need people who are bilingual. Because I yes. think it's, it's very important, um, in my experience, to have, to have translators and interpreters in the group. Um, it's really not enough to have a chemist and a machine learner and an engineer and a biologist and a clinician in the same room if they don't speak the same language. So it is, I think, important in our educational processes to really lean into some of our structures. We have some here at MIT through IMS and HST and many other structures where people are really formally trained in more than one discipline. And I think you need to intentionally put those people in the team. Yeah, let, let's, let's um, we're going to come to this later, but we're on the topic now. So let's talk about, um, you know, obviously one of the challenges for convergent work is the, I hate to call them silos, but it's the organization of our enterprise. So perhaps different in a company, but a university has departments that are disciplinarily specific and schools that are kind of mega disciplinarily specific. And there are all kinds of um, things that we do that increase the um, barriers rather than increasing the permeability. And um, you know, those of you who have heard me speak before will have heard many of my cliches repeated many times. <laughs> but what happens at MIT at a rate that I hadn't seen before is that one person will find, in, your, in one department, will find someone in another department and start a conversation somewhere that then becomes a collaboration. In my mind, that's a footpath. And those two people have you know, paved that footpath you know, on their own. But what we need to be able to do, and this is why we need to think about our curriculum, how we teach, how we speak about what we're doing, is to turn those footpaths into super highways so everyone is not bushwhacking, you know, spending the time to figuring out how to get to someone, find someone who may have something to share. And it's a huge challenge. Uh, somehow at the COPE, we've managed to, I think, accelerate those cross-disciplinary convergences. And it's because of all of the stuff we do together, you know, the seminars that in the day we, days we attended seminars, <laughs> people would come together. But I would just love to get your thoughts, though, because you all have actually, you know, uh, gotten out of your, um, you know, gone beyond your guardrails or your footpath and, and established, you know, methods and practices whereby the people in your lab are convergent. You yourselves are convergent. And so do you have thoughts about not just how we educate, but also how we structure our institutions? And I have to say, I am not in favor of no departmental boundaries. Humans like to be organized. They you know, operate well when they're organized. And frankly, if you're going to do chemistry, it's a really good idea to learn a whole lot of chemistry <laughs> before you go sailing into a chem lab. And similarly, I could say the same for any of our very advanced disciplines, which that's all we do at MIT. So how have you thought about this problem? Is it just you know, designed for a particular task? You've got an experiment going on, so you put together a group, and they kind of co-educate. Can, can we do it more intentionally? What can we do to prepare all of us, but in particular our trainees, to be better prepared for um, the future as foggily as it looks from here? But um, you know, what are your thoughts having actually brought people through your labs? Go ahead, Phil. Uh, I want to say something that might not be popular. Open the doors of MIT. Mm. To? We can't get in the buildings Oh, yeah. Mm. Open the doors to MIT. <laughs> Second, come in. <laughs> Those conversations between students walking in the hallways and outside of meetings are really the difference between being just good and being great. And if we don't recover that spontaneity, 
it is going to really handicap what we do. So we've had an incredibly pushback over the last two years due to COVID. I'm sorry to tell you, we've lost momentum. Yeah. We've lost spontaneity. And I think you have to, you have to deal with that. Now, uh, let me answer your, not answer your question. I think my experiences at MIT have been, undergrads do things that are just marvelous. Just, just take any undergrad that comes out of mathematics, computer science, physicists in your, your lab and let them talk to people and within two months, two weeks, they'll be doing wonderful things. At a graduate level, there's a lot of interest over in many engineering departments, computer science and others. We just need resources that fund people who actually move across disciplines. And most of that funding has come out of private sources who supported a lot of initiatives where you, know, you can get enough money to, to start a collaboration between various people. Uh, but if you give graduate students the opportunity, even if they're not speaking the language, in a few months, knowing that someone else they want to collaborate with knows a body of information they don't, they start, they start learning. And they'll, you know, they, they'll start reading books and talking to people and filling in that background. And so over a, a you know, four or five month period, they'll come to being totally bilingual and over several years have an appreciation of the cultural difference. But there is a big cultural difference between a, an engineering orientation to science and science. And we need both. And we have to find ways of appreciating and celebrating that that difference. Yeah, I love your focus on students. When I came to MIT, I've forgotten who said it, maybe Bob Horvitz said, our students are the plasmids that transfer <laughs> information <laughs> from one lab to the next. It's not the viruses. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're viruses. <laughs> Other thoughts so, on this, Paula, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I thought about this a lot, and, and as a department head, we go through all kinds of um, thinking processes about our curriculum. Uh, I think that we do need disciplinary hubs, but we absolutely need more room for students to be able to explore the other interfaces. And uh, when we have uh, some ability to loosen our structure, or redefine some of our requirements so that they can let additional elements in, that's a part of the solution, but it's not the entire solution. I love what Sangeeta said. Language is how I think about uh, uh, my first experiences at the Koch Institute because I didn't speak biology and uh, I had to sit in meetings and Google all of the words and write them down <laughs> in the background. Uh, but, but immersion is how you learn and uh, students are ready and open. They are in a mode of active listening that um, is, is unique to that, that part of life. And if we can get those students to be able to have um, access to classes that enable them to take a dive into some of the more complex but more interesting topics in other fields, uh, but still be able to do that with some level of access. In other words, you don't have to be a semi-expert to get in on this. Um, that, would in, that would be incredibly enabling. And right now, uh, there aren't very many classes that allow an entry ramp uh, for those who are non-experts. Somehow we have to think about how we create courses that allow that, and also opportunities. My, my other thought is that the fastest way that those of us at the Koch Institute have learned how to interact with each other is by diving together in lab. Students start talking to each other and you just immediately learn, because you have to learn. <laughs> you, 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 you need to learn new protocols. You have to understand what your collaborator is talking about. So if we can also create uh, more opportunities on lower levels for collaborations to try new ideas, to experiment with small buckets of money, be it for undergraduates or even for graduate students. 
um, I think that would be particularly enabling to allow those students to innovate and to uh, try out new ideas. And it would also cause students to seek each other out, which is a, a bit of what Phil had said. If, if, you, if you say, hey, you have an opportunity, here's a, a little pot of money, um, go and find a, a fellow, a peer to collaborate with, you will see much more of this integration and, and language learning. Thank you to your lab is wildly cross-disciplinary. What do you do to help get people up to speed? Yeah, that's a great question. I was thinking a little bit about the leadership of the KI and how each of us run our individual groups. And I think there's something about the way we model convergence, um, which is to be comfortable not knowing um, and to to have the sort of muscle of knowing that you can wander into a fuzzy area and that you get smart people in the room and we're gonna figure it out and we're gonna refine the problem and we'll come up with a solution, but it's a little bit of a journey. Um, and I feel like you know, in the, in the KI, we, we see that a lot. So that you're not judging each other. Everybody wants, we're all here, we want, we're excellent, we're type A, we wanna be smart, <laughs> we wanna be accomplished. But you have to really be comfortable with like, okay, I'm not an expert in this and, and I'm gonna figure it out and we have to sort of forgive each other that, that you know, on-ramp, if you will. Um, so I think that's something that we all do quite naturally, but it's pretty special, it doesn't exist everywhere. Yeah, so it's a cultural quest issue yeah. and one of the things that often surprises me, not every time, at, in the Koch Institute seminars, and of course this is one of the things that happens in person, never happens in Zoom, uh, that someone asks a dumb question, right? And it's understood that you know if you're an engineer and you're listening to this incredibly high level biology, you may not understand the vocabulary. And I mean, I've, I've been um, delighted that questions asked earnestly <laughs> are answered earnestly mm -hmm. rather than dismissively, and that is a cultural uh, condition that I think is kind of in the, you know, in the water uh, at the Koch Institute. And it's not everywhere at MIT, it's not you know, everywhere at all, but I do think that's part of it. It says permission to learn. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I might go back to something Phil said in the very beginning with the open the doors and actually come in. Mm -hmm. I think in the pandemic, I was reflecting when you were talking and after. In the pandemic, people started confounding uh, short-term productivity and efficiency with long-term impact and creativity. And so you can be super effective. You just do your work, you do your experiments, you analyze the data, you write the papers, whatever it is that we do, but you forget what you lose. Yeah. And it's that stuff that starts as a distraction that usually leads to the biggest thing. And that's why it's so important that people are together. Honestly, they, they, they disrupt each other's work all the time. They make themselves <laughs> inefficient. You walk somewhere just to grab a cup of coffee and now you're gonna be late. Those are the good things and we forget that. Yeah. So that's kind of from the less organization and classes and so on. But I think it applies to the classroom as well. That what we learned, is even on younger children, I mean, my kids are still young, that in-person school was a huge thing. You took it away, and turns out people don't learn so well. And we all thought that the future was, was completely virtual, and it turned out that for kids who were born with a device in their hand, it wasn't good. They were seeking these in-person interactions where you learn in the less formal way, but you actually learn really deep. So I think those are things that we really have to nurture in all institutions and in all environments, because that's how humans have evolved, likely, mm -hmm. and it's hard to let go of it and it's hard to emulate it in other environments. So that's, that's to Phil's point. The other one about groups, I think part of it, and that might go to something uh, Paula said as well, that some of it is about who's there, and some of it is about the many ways in which they think expectations are set. And don't underestimate how much people assume versus what is actually being told or said and so on. And when people would come to, to my group, and still when people come to my group, I would say, oh, it's like a triangle. Sometimes I'd say it's like a square. We have like three vertices where like there could be the pure mathematician or the pure technologist or the pure biologist. But people move, right? They move throughout the entire area of that triangle while they come to this lab. That's the, that's the cool stuff that happens. And from this, people realize, oh, I kind of am expected to learn new things and go out of the thing that I'm an expert in, and I'm going to teach other people in the process. And I think this lifelong learning is super important in a place like MIT. 
where else would you, would you represent that? So that applies to the undergrads, to our grad students, to our postdocs, to our faculty. It can't be like, well, I trained in this, and ergo, that's what I do. If something else is important for the problem you want to solve, you're smart, go and learn it. Work with somebody who knows it and learn from them. In some cases, you will get to the level of an expert. In some cases, you are not. All of them are learnings. So that's, I think, part of the message that we need to send, along with specialization is actually important. Depth is important. You can't just, you can't just hop around without actually knowing what you're talking about. That's a very risky business in science, and it can lead us all wrong. Yes. You, know, we, you know, we all know how hard it is to actually get something done, something important done, you know, in the lab. It, it, you know, it's not for the faint of heart, but one of the things that struck me, both at the Koch and then watching some of the collaborations between our colleagues in uh, computer science, uh, you know, working at MGH on these projects is that, you know, these trainees have a sense of, like, uh, just ebullience that you sometimes see in your own students, but not always. But it's just this kind of, you know, crazy excitement. And I think part of that is this learning environment. Yeah where you know, they do feel that they're you know, always learning and they're actually contributing in a frontier that is clearly not yet well paved. And frequently, they are the expert in that new frontier. <laughs> exactly. right. And you, as a faculty member, are trying to understand what totally. you know what they're saying. Exactly, you're along <laughs> yeah. for the ride. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, uh, you know, we all grew up in departments, right? <laughs> Um, and it's one thing when, you know, uh, a trainee comes into your world, right? And they're kind of, you know, they, 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 you're, they're adopted into your family, into this bilingual, you know, crazy mashup of cultures. Um, but I do wonder, you know, about thoughts about <clears throat> what we can do in general to foster this kind of permissiveness or expectation that you will be bilingual when already it takes a long time to be an expert in your field. So how do we do both? How do we actually get, you know, encourage our students to have the disciplinary depth that we absolutely require and to make it possible for them to have this kind of cross-disciplinary awareness? Is it simply, you know, using the structures we currently have or do we need to think about other ways to organize ourselves? We tell them that it's okay to speak English with an Israeli accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, we stick to the language metaphor. Not my, not my native tongue. Learned it that way, right? Yeah. I'm not bilingual. Bilingual are my kids who speak two languages mm. as a native language. Mm. I'm not, mm -hmm. but it's OK. Yeah. I can still actually manage in English. Yeah. And that, I think, that is something that's often hard for super accomplished and smart people, right. that it's hard for them to speak with an accent. They're embarrassed that they're not exactly right. And once you conquer that embarrassment, you realize that's awesome. I have something that I have, an, I mean, I'm, I definitely don't have an accent in Hebrew, right? That's my native tongue, for those who might not know. But uh. I am totally fine with the fact that I have an accent in English. It's who I am. And you know, maybe once in a while it even helps me. I see something that I wouldn't see if, if it were my native language. And I think the same way about you know, biology and, uh, and computer science, or about immunology, a field I love dearly and have worked in for many, many years, and I would never call myself an immunologist. Mm -hmm. I have many friends who are true immunologists. I am very honored to work with them, and I speak immunology with an accent, and I'm proud of that. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what, we have, that's, what we need, that's what we need to tell our people, that that's yeah. OK. Yeah, I would say amen to that. And I, I believe it's, it's a cultural thing. I think it's something that we, are, we need to continually remind our students it's OK. Yeah. Uh, it's OK for you to be an expert in A in this uh, non-expert B world and bring your stuff that you're bringing something yeah. new and of high value because you have this different and new lens. And one of the things I've always loved about MIT is that I've always felt that people could walk down the hallway, you could reach out and find someone in the hallway and start a conversation with them and find that there's something that you both are excited about, but that person is going to have a different lens and perspective on that problem. Maybe they're the expert and you're not, but there's a respect across the board that you are coming with something, something that is worth listening to and right. hearing. Yeah, I think what's interesting, I don't know if you guys are all experiencing this, but I mean, this is, I have two kids too. I mean, it's a I know. <laughs> TikTok generation, right? And, and so I feel like there, there's, there's really a place for, for patiently building your expertise. Like it's great to want to do convergence, right? And they're going to see it all around them, but you really have to have 
some deep expertise to bring. And so I think there's a tension um, because you, you know you can't you can't skip that part. No, I don't can. think so. Um, I, I feel like in my own group, that's a conversation that I have a lot with my trainees. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah. Um, I want to. I have some people in looking for positions in this mm. around me at MIT, and I want to say MIT is not every institution. No. And when people leave MIT and find positions, they are going to need to understand the culture of the institute they're you know, applying to. They need a discipline. They need something to say, I'm X. And then do their research and change the world. So I understand the students out there that this can seem you know, difficult to find that opportunity and, uh, and to find a, 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 a department that appreciates the novelty and the change that has to come about by, by being convergent. But at the end of the day, the impact you'll have is so enormous and much larger <laughs> than someone who's confined to a certain discipline in thinking and working, that it, it, it's well worth persevering and, and, and getting involved. Mm -hmm. But we do have, as faculty and, and as an institution, need to make apparent to our colleagues and elsewhere that this is terribly important and it's, it's the future of their disciplines and their field uh, and to, to promote people. Uh, in the community. Yeah, yeah. We, we hate to, I mean, I hate to think of throwing our trainees out into a world that does not have receptor sites for them, mm -hmm. right? And we're talking about funding. I mean, we didn't, it was a, a topic I thought we might talk about, but I don't think we actually need to. It's just hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get funding for uh, cross-disciplinary work. Our federal agencies are set up, you know, from our perspective in a quite siloed way. And, you know, anyone who's tried to get an engineering, uh, you know, biology convergent uh, grant through the NIH has understood just how big that brick wall is and to throw oneself against. So I think that, um, you know, you all have raised this issue, and Phil, you've just, you know, kind of put a well-defined it, which is that we have to um, prepare our trainees <laughs> for a world uh, that may not quite be ready for them, but they are going to be recruited by places that want to do something like MIT, even though their standards for success may not yet be the kinds of standards that we hold. But I can tell you, when I arrived, I was told, you can't do cross-disciplinary work, you'll never get tenure. And I said, really? And then and I actually <laughs> found some examples that I could use to say, but you know, so-and-so did, and so-and-so did. But it's not, I, I think MIT has moved very rapidly uh, to embrace this convergent attitude. Um, but you know, for someone who's the head of a department <laughs> that may be um, you know, more devoted to the uh, disciplinary principles, um, you know, you understand the, the challenges. The tension, absolutely. Yes. I, I do want yep. to say, Susan, mm. that from my experience with people who were abroad and went to um, other places, yep. there was always this question mark, like would they succeed in an environment which was not set in the same way? Or would places hire them? But if they hired them, would they be? And places would call you back up and say, but if you took them out of the abroad, would they still be? Exactly. And I have to say, it all worked out extremely well. They <laughs> both got the jobs, and they were successful, and they kind of brought the gospel with them. Yes. I think people who are trained, who have, on the one hand, the depth in an area, and on the other hand, the ability to kind of take that depth and then leverage it with other things around them, mm -hmm. they do well, and they change the people around them. So I'm more of an optimist. Looking at that, I think actually the world has responded quite well. And you see the impact in other places, and it's our responsibility as a place like MIT and other places that are like that, it's our responsibility to be in the vanguard and kind of push now uh, to the next level. I, I agree entirely, and it's yeah. something that I think the Koch Institute can be very, very, um, I would say, um, proud of what we've done over this last decade. And it's not just what we've done inside the building, but the people we've sent out to, uh, to the world. Yeah, share the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, go ahead. You know, I was going to say, I think also we've talked a lot about cross-disciplinary, you know, within the academy, but I think another feature of the COPE is, mm -hmm. is the connection to the hospitals, right? Yes. So that clinical connection and the conversation with industry. 
Um, and I think going forward, that's going to be even more important. There's so much science happening in other places. Um, and, and that's an opportunity, I think, for, for how we evolve this model. And it's part of this lifelong training. Yeah. Because so, you take this you know, academic research, and you want to do something different with it. That's another kind of learning. And it's fine. Yeah. You, no one knows it when they get started. And they learn, and they yeah. figure it out as they go as, as So as said. we conclude, <laughs> you each get you know, a minute or two to uh, tell us kind of your, uh, your dream. Uh, what, what should we be paying attention to? What should we be looking for um, over the next, what are we going to say? We'll make it a short-term future, five or 10 years. What are you going to see, Paula? What, what will we be seeing? What should we be listening for, looking for? I think there are two things that I think about. One is uh, that we will become much more capable of detecting disease in its earliest stages or pre-disease states. And I think this is something that will be enabled by computation, enabled by everything from molecular and nanomedicine to protein engineering. But in those advances, we'll be able to determine uh, whether an individual is at risk, whether an individual needs to take a step. And I think that is going to be transformative, both in cancer and in, across the board in our health states. Thank you. The diagnostics deficit. The diagnostics deficit. Yeah. We're going to go after it. I think that, that we're poised now to be able to conquer it. And uh, that will allow us to apply it even to um, some of the uh, more general uh, disease states such as diabetes and, uh, and uh, heart disease. The other thing that I think about is the ability to uh, better master, I don't think there'll ever be such a thing as master, but better master our ability to manipulate the immune system and enable it to respond to cancer, I think particularly, um, and to other kinds of disease states. And I think that's going to be transformative if we can uh, understand how we can take our tool sets and very selectively uh, manipulate the immune state in ways that we haven't before. We've, we've started, but we're really just, we're working with sort of clunky tools right now. And I think that's going to be a big advance. Aviv? One thing I said already, predictive generative interpretable. Better predictions ability to generate the therapeutics we need in a different way than we've generated before, which was a very difficult search, and the ability to interpret our models of the world, which, by the way, can be learned by an algorithm or written by us on, on the board, but really to interpret what is going on. That's, I think, where we're headed in many, many different forms. Second thing I would say is uh, tissue biology view. I think it's time is really now that we have, we've had many decades of cells and wonderfully, wonderfully so, and I love that personally more probably than anything in the world, but, um, but the, the, the organization of tissues and the function of tissues, both how they maintain homeostasis and then how they go into pathology, which is another type of bad yeah. steady state, is really something that's within our grasp, and, and where more than in tumors, I cannot come up with a better idea, and it's probably going to show us the way. If only because tumors are actually accessible to us in ways that most human tissues are not. And so we should be doing more there. And also the genetic variation from the somatic side is actually going to help us understand them better. So that's, that's uh, two different sides, technical and biological. Yeah, great. It's, it's hard to go last because everyone no, takes no, all the good answers. Less. I know. Phil's <laughs> <laughs> more than capable of anchoring any conversations. <laughs> um, look, I agree with you both. I will add. I will add. Um, I think that, um, <laughs> that nanotechnology will enable therapeutics <laughs> because genome editing, base editing, um, RNA delivery, all the new RNA, circular RNA, all of these things require uh, chaperones in the body. And I, I think that's going to be a really important part of the next chapter. Um, one thing that I think is not on our priority list, but I hope becomes part of the next chapter, is global oncology. Um, I think uh, it's really connected to the healthcare disparities and rural cancer care conversation that we heard about. And I think there's a way of thinking called frugal engineering, which is constrained innovation. And if we really think about what diagnosis and treatment looks like in a limited resource setting, I truly believe that that would transform cancer care in the next chapter. 
great. We haven't heard him talk about that. That was wonderful. Phil. So I won't say anything about machine learning because if Eve <laughs> has uh, commented on it, our nanoparticles, or, or, you know, all the other things. I would say that um, at a really fundamental level, analyzing biological processes and tissues at a single molecule level is going to really impact everything we do. And it comes from single molecule imaging in live cells to single molecule identification in tissue, to single molecule diagnostic assays. Pushing our technology down to that level uh, uh, and then learning how to statistically and, and others interpret it it is really changing now and is, is oh, I mean, cryo-EM is going to single molecule yeah. imaging with machine learning and cryo-EM. It's just it's totally exciting. So I think at, at a fundamental level, I think that's a very important technology. It sweeps many scales. So you've just, kind of, the progress of science is getting a higher and higher level of resolution. And what you're now saying is, you know, we'll get to the single molecule level and that will inform, you know, you know all of what we do in, Thank goodness for machine learning, because we couldn't manage it in our little teeny mm -hmm. brains, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. I can't tell you, um, you know, I, if I could have had, uh, choreographed a conversation that would have made me feel optimistic about the future, it would have been with these uh, four colleagues. Thank you so much for uh, joining me in this adventure to the future. Thank you, Susan. <laughs>